Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Garud Iyengar. I am a faculty member in the Operations Research Department at Columbia University. And before that, I used to be the Associate Director for the Data Science Institute of Columbia. Blockchains and the way blockchains are revolutionizing all things data had been a central part of what the Data Science Institute was doing. And I, my particular interest in uh, this aspect is not so much from the computer science aspect, but also but looking at it from the economic aspect of why do blockchain solutions sometimes do not get adopted and what can we do to make them adopted at scale? So what I'm gonna be talking about today is a step in that direction, a simple model to understand why permission blockchains, not permissionless, but permission blockchains are not getting adopted and identify the reasons why they're not getting adopted and try to see if there are ways that we can mitigate them. All right, so the paper that I'm going to be presenting today is called Economics of Permission Blockchain Adoption. This is joint work with my colleague at Columbia, Jay Sethuraman, our joint PhD student, Benjen Wang, and a collaborator from Wake Forest University, Fahad Saleh. So blockchains are an ideal data structure for information sharing. Um, they provide immutable entries, which means that there is an audit trail for everything that has been done. And in particular, permission blockchains are better because the entities that are providing the consensus are in fact connected to uh, physical entities, which means that you can actually put a name to them. Uh, there are privacy preserving operations that you can do on the data, which such that only certain part of the data is visible and often only certain functions of the data is visible. And this can be very useful in setting up all kinds of rep reputation metrics, trying to make sure that various participants in the blockchain are only able to see the data that is relevant to them. Um, it's also distributed, which means that from a, from a security perspective, it cannot be attacked and brought down. So all of, for all of these reasons, blockchains can be game-changing for cross-firm collaborations. But what we've been seeing is that although from a computer science perspective, from a perspective of the underlying consensus mechanism, all things are great, they are not being adopted in many industries. And one of the things that we wanted to investigate was what are the industrial organizational aspects that are preventing blockchains from getting, in, getting adopted in some industries. And what we do in this paper is provide a very minimal network infrastructure that is able to adopt, identify such an adoption failure, that's able to figure out why these things do not get adopted, and then we provide a very simple resolution for it. So think of this paper as a stepping stone towards understanding what happens in larger networks. Here we are trying to bring the problem down to its simplest essence. So before I get down to the actual problem, I want you to think about a very toy example. The game consists of three agents, but only two players, meaning there are only two players that make decisions, but there are three agents that get welfare out of them. So that's player one, that's player two. If player one and player two adopt, they both end up paying a cost of one unit. That's the one unit there. But player three, or agent three, sorry, I correct myself, it's not player because they don't take decision. Agent three ends up getting a payoff of four. So the net societal payoff is of two units. Similarly, in this particular cell, if neither of the player adopts, then neither of the players actually ends up paying any cost, but agent three does not get any benefits either. And if you just stare at this matrix for a moment, you can convince yourself that the unique equilibrium here is going to be don't adopt, don't adopt both players do not adopt or take the don't adopt decision and society ends up losing two units of social welfare that they could have gotten from here, which is the social optimal action pair. And they move to this cell where nobody gets anything. So this is sort of a, uh, where our discussions began about looking at blockchains because what was happening was the cost of the blockchain was coming from one set of entities, but the benefits were being externalized in some sense. And unless you're able to in, endog in or internalize some of those network benefits that were coming, the chances are that people will go to the equilibrium which is not socially optimal. 
For this particular toy example, we can solve the problem by transferring welfare from the third agent, the agent that basically gets all the welfare to the first two agents. So what I've done over here is I've taken three units of welfare. This cell was four units. So I took three units of welfare and distributed them to 1.5 to player one and 1.5 to player two. So therefore now their trade off becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and the payoff for player, sorry, agent three becomes one. It's still positive, but it's lower than what it was before. But, and similar things have been done in the other cells. The transfer are budget balance. That means you do not have to inject any more cash. But what this transfer does is move the equilibrium from zero, 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 which was the earlier equilibrium, but not socially optimal, to making this socially optimal equilibrium of both players adopting the, uh, the solution to become socially optimal. And in fact, it becomes the unique equilibrium. So what I want you to take away from this basic example is there are often situations when the social welfare is coming from a third agent who is not the decision maker, who cannot influence this, the decision makers of player one and two. Player one and two end up financing the social welfare. And so there is a possibility that the equilibrium, in equilibrium, they do not adopt uh, the solution that could be socially optimal. And one way to solve this problem is to do transfers. And we'll, we'll now what we're gonna do is take this story over to a more realistic supply chain network and see how this essence can be uh, almost represented in that network. So we're gonna be looking at a very simple business setting. It's a simple supply chain. There's a single vendor. There are a bunch of manufacturers and a bunch of consumers. And the network that we're thinking about is of this sort a single vendor that serves all manufacturers. In this particular example, I'm only showing two, but pretend that there are N different manufacturers. All of these manufacturers are competing for a bunch of consumers. And there is, what we are showing is that when, if there is a blockchain, there is information sharing across manufacturers. That is the layer at which information sharing happens. There's a single vendor, and so there isn't really much information sharing that's happening between the manufacturer and the vendor. We have these edges called product quality displayed over here. And implicitly what we are assuming is that the consumer makes decisions of which manufacturer to buy from based on the quality of this manufacturer. And we'll get down to the details of this in a moment. So vendors. Uh, vendors just produce the goods and ship them to different manufacturers. There's a single vendor. So every manufacturer effectively is buying from the same vendor. So the story here is that the, the way manufacturers differentiate themselves is on the basis of quality. And we'll get to quality in a couple of slides. Right now, what we want to look at the situation is why in such a setting, blockchains might be useful. And one canonical example that I want you to keep in mind while you're going through these slides is that of a food supply chain. The vendors here are farms. They potentially supply food or food items. Let's you want to keep some item in mind, think of spinach. So they supply spinach to all kinds of grocery stores. More often than not, things are fine, but food can get contaminated at times. And these contaminated items can go cause serious illnesses. And even if uh, the cause is often known, trying to do recalls can become expensive because you don't often keep track of exactly which vendor this bunch of spinach came from, what other grocery stores was the same spinach sent and so on. So the blockchain enables efficient tracing of these defects and thereby saving costs. And this is, this is the kind of motivation that I want you to keep in mind that vendors sometimes produce defective goods. When the defective goods are not recalled in time, you end up getting you end up getting serious reputational costs and manufacturers want to avoid this cost. And one way to do that is to get information about the defective goods early. All right, so before we talk about manufacturers, we're gonna jump further down the network and look at con uh, consumer welfare. Consumers want to purchase from the highest quality manufacturers. And quality here does not mean defect. 
it does not mean um, because if there were defects, the manufacturer would have not sold that item at all. Product quality here includes information like packing dates, transportation times. So some manufacturers might be better at keeping fresher fruit. Identity of the source that can determine whether ethical standards are met. So some are able to provide you this information better. Others are able to provide you information about processing standards and so on. So that's what we mean by quality. And what consumers want to do is purchase from a manufacturer that has the highest quality. And like I said, quality does not help determine defect because if that was the case, the manufacturers would have not uh, sold that item at all. One thing that we've been seeing is that even though information about quality is welfare enhancing for the consumer, manufacturers often resist sharing this information. And what we see through our paper is that the sharing could be beneficial for all parties. Uh, however, there is a transfer that is needed. And the reason a transfer is needed, as you can start imagining here, that the social welfare of the consumers in, is enhanced and that has to be somehow fed back to the manufacturer. So I'm sort of looking forward a little bit in what the modeling is, but that's the kind of direction that we are going in. All right. Now let's try to understand manufacturers. So manufacturers sit between vendors and consumers. These are the people that buy from vendors and sell it to consumers. And again, just to conceptualize the food chain, so food supply chain story, grocer sells to consumers. Grocers fail reputation costs if they sell contaminated food. If we know that a particular grocer has sold contaminated food, perhaps I don't want to return to that. And so at least there is a short term dip in their revenue. Identifying contaminated shipments expediently reduces costs, costs, uh, reputation costs, because then you know that this firm has picked it up, picked up the information quickly and then handed it over to potentially the, uh, the recall people and the consumers are not going to be hurt as much. An immutable audit trail from the farmer to consumer can help. Uh, often there is a negotiation that happens around food recall as to who was at fault? Where did it happen? Did it happen at the time of actual growing? Did it happen during the transfer from the vendor to the grocer and so on? And so having an immutable audit trail that is able to keep track of the food as it passes through the supply chain is going to be useful. Immutable in the sense that they can, it cannot be changed after the fact. Already, I'm sort of laying down the groundwork for why a blockchain could be very useful in this setup. The cause can be identified early and recall can be implemented. And now the reason why blockchains can potentially allow the cause to be identified early is that if all the grocers in the market are on the blockchain, then anyone discovering that particular fault or defect can get communicated to all the grocers. So instead of each grocer relying on their particular time to discovery, they all get to see it at the minimum time to discovery of all the manufacturers, that is all the grocers that are on the supply chain. So the difference is either it's my time or everybody else's time, the minimum of everybody else's time. And you can show that as you increase the number of grocers in the blockchain, this second piece, which is the minimum of everybody's time ends up being much, much smaller than my own time. And this cost saving serves as a motivation for the blockchain. All right. So let's set it up to a little bit more general model. So the, the food supply chain was a motivation and it's a very strong motivation for our work, but let's abstract it away a little bit. The manufacturer's welfare consists of three components. Revenue, and you increase revenue by attracting customers by signaling quality. I'm going to put all my transactions on the blockchain. Consumers can potentially verify it. Well, they're not going to directly verify it, but maybe there are third party players that come in and set up uh, some sort of apps that customers are able to see what my past transactions are, what my record is in terms of quality and so on, uh, ratings and things of that sort. Reputation cost, I want to minimize reputation cost by detecting defects early. And adoption cost, I have to pay for adopting the blockchain. So the first two things, are unequivocally good for me. Uh, there is an issue with the attracting customers part that I'll come in a moment. But on the face of it, the first two terms look like good for a manufacturer when they adopt blockchain. And the third one being the bad part. 
And as we have paper progressed, we found that even the revenue part can end up being a reason for not adopting the blockchain. So this is a repeat of what we are saying that we brought the single vendor in to simplify the story. So when everybody adopts a blockchain, you see the, contam the contamination is identified uh, at the minimum of the two detection times. Here we are looking at an example of two manufacturer. If there are N manufacturer, then it's going to be the minimum of N detection time uh, without, and as you can also see, uh, this is not clear from a simple analysis, but a little bit more detailed analysis, you can see that the benefits increase with the market share of the adopting manufacturers. The blockchain also helps higher quality manufacturers because it reduces the error in the quality signal. And the way we model this is by saying that the manufacturers put their past interaction data on this blockchain, consumers are able to view it, and as a result, get a better signal. And this potentially can lead to concentration of demand. And that has bad implications for detecting defects because now everything is being done by very few manufacturers and potentially this diversification effect that you were getting from blockchains may not happen. And that's another reason why um, blockchains may not get adopted. All right, so that's the context. And now we're gonna go through and show you various results that we've been able to obtain in this setting. And just to fix ideas, let me just go and remind you of the network. Here's the network, single vendor, N different manufacturers. We're trying to understand when and why manufacturers adopt or do not adopt the blockchain. There's a consumer downstream. The consumer gets better quality information if the manufacturers happen to be on the blockchain. All right. So going back to the results section now. First thing that we find in this simple model is that blockchain always enhances consumer welfare. Uh, this is not very surprising. Consumers incur no cost, but you receive useful information. Consumers are able to select higher quality manufacturers on, our, on average because the blockchain improves what happens to their quality. And by the way, um, I should have mentioned it right in the beginning, there's a paper that goes with it. it. The title of the paper is Economics of Permission Blockchains. It's available um, online if you just search for it. And that, that's where all the mathematical model has been made clear. Here, I'm trying to give you uh, the, the main messages without getting too much into the details of the mathematics. Uh, the consumer enhancement, consumer welfare enhancement result is true even if the blockchains do not fully reveal manufacturer quality. Uh, even if it just improves manufacturer quality, welfare goes up. So here there are no ifs and buts. Consumers always benefit. Now we want to understand what happens at the manufacturer level because those are the guys that have to decide whether to adopt the blockchain. Consumers cannot do anything about it. They might love that manufacturers go onto a blockchain, but they can't make that decision for them, right? Now what we find is that blockchain is welfare enhancing for the manufacturers only for intermediate detect, defect detection rates. So that's sort of surprising. One would have thought that this should be a uniform result. And the reason this result ends up happening is that at low defect detection rate, investing in the blockchain is no longer profitable because the rates are so low that you're not able, no manufacturer is able to detect soon enough to avoid significant reputation costs. If the defect detection rate is high, then manufacturers don't care about blockchains because they can detect it early on their own. So it's really the middle part where it's not so high that I can detect it on my own or so low that even going onto the blockchain doesn't help me. That's the sweet spot at which manufacturers are going to be interested in a blockchain. Okay, so let's say that we are in that intermediate domain where manufacturers are indeed interested in the blockchain. What happens there? Well, it turns out that blockchain may reduce welfare even when there are no adoption costs. We are in the regime where detection rates are decent in the intermediate range so that a potential manufacturer is interested in being on the blockchain. 
And even then, and there are no adoption costs. So we've removed the component of the cost. So we can't say that they are not adopting because it's, the cost is too high. Even then, it turns out that adopting blockchains may, uh, may not be very good for the manufacturers. And the way this happens is through the quality anchor. Blockchains improve the quality signal. Because of this, manufacturers that are ex ante sort of more comparable end up becoming more separated in the minds of the consumers. As a result, consumers start putting more and more weight on the higher quality manufacturers. So you end up concentrating demand more. And as a result of this concentration of demand, the detection, the early detection part gets hampered. You have fewer. So the way to think about this is that if, if earlier the demand was spread out, then there were, let's say, N different manufacturers that were independently looking for faults. Now, because of a concentration of demand, that number has dramatically reduced. As a result, when you're taking the minimum of the detection time, you're taking a minimum over a much reduced set. And as a result, if the reputation costs are large enough, you end up actually seeing a worse behavior. So it has to be, again, these are all stories that we are trying to develop as to see why X, when you look at the dy dynamics of these, this market, it seems obvious that blockchain should be welfare enhancing for the entire society why things can go bad. And even at the societal level, things are beneficial, and we'll see in a moment under what conditions. Even then, it will happen that the manufacturers lose and the consumers benefit a lot. Think back to the toy example that we had in the beginning, the two players lose, but the third agent benefits dramatically. And we need to figure out how to do that, how to get that solution back into this setup. So, Here's, a, here's an interesting and tricky part. So the fluid blockchain adoption depends on beliefs unrelated to fundamentals. Uh, and I'll, I'll unpack this statement in a moment. So first of all, in equilibrium, if you want blockchains to be adopted, then all manufacturers must prefer adoptions when others adopt. That's just a basic statement. Now, when when a manufacturer is trying to compare two decisions, whether to adopt or not to adopt, we are looking at a situation where everybody else has adopted and there is a manufacturer that's trying to understand whether they should adopt or not adopt. Not adopting is an off path action, meaning that this is not part of the equilibrium. So one has to understand what happens to this off path action. And in order to understand the impact of this off path action, you need to uh, think in terms of off-path beliefs. And the adoption decision actually does depend on these off-path beliefs. And we will see that these off-path beliefs end up becoming important. And we'll not get into the details of it in this talk, but in the paper, it's all special, spelled out. So under certain belief structures, an adoption equilibrium is particularly unlikely. And in other belief structures, an adoption equilibrium is likely. And the point that I want you to take away from here is that even after you have put in all the conditions necessary for the manufacturer to potentially adopt, there is an education aspect or a PR aspect that has to be done with the customers to change their beliefs so that this equilibrium can be sustained. So that's another one of the messages that we want to get. Blockchain, as we said, that blockchain adoption may not arise even when total wealth it's when total welfare is enhanced. And this happens because consumers always benefit, but they do not play a role in adoption. Manufacturer bear costs, but do not gain from adoption. And that's what we call a market failure. And we, we have designed in the paper uh, a system of transfers that can be charged to consumers and paid to the manufacturers to make this happen. So whenever all the economic conditions lead to blockchain adoption at a societal level, we can design a transfer that can make this happen even at the individual level, that manufacturers are happy and consumers are happy. So the key insights from this particular supply chain example was that blockchains can provide valuable information to consumers, but consumers don't detect, determine blockchain adoption. It, blockchains have ambiguous value to manufacturers, 
And one may have to, one not may, but in most circumstances will have to define transfer mechanisms that can take consumer benefits and transfer it to the manufacturers that are incurring costs. Just a few conclusions. Blockchain has value in business settings. Almost always societal benefit goes up. This adoption may not arise due to misaligned incentives. And one has to look at the economic structure of the incentive carefully to design right mechanisms of intervention. Sometimes it has to be in terms of transfers, and sometimes it may also be in terms of changing off path beliefs, changing beliefs about the various players. And both of them is necessary in order for us to get blockchains adopted in various markets. Thank you very much.